I was, as I was trying to say, the subject of the Indo-Pacific security and multilateral engagement in this region is one that I follow not so much as a researcher, but as an instructor at UT. Um, and I know that several students who have taken my international relations of East and Southeast Asia are in the audience, and I'm looking forward to hopefully hearing um, some feedback from you when we get to Q&A. Now, this can be a challenging course um, sometimes for me because I find myself having to rewrite my lectures each year to account for changes emanating from China, the resulting shifts in the regional balance of power, and Washington's constantly evolving relationship with the region. So this is, in short, a vitally important region, politically, economically, in terms of security, and it is in constant flux. And this is especially true today, three months into the Biden administration. Washington is once again in the midst of changing its methods of engagement with the region and, re and in ways that really could have very far reaching consequences for all of us. For example, in response to challenges from China and the perceived weaknesses of many multilateral organizations globally and in the region, the administration is now reconnecting with its old friends in new ways. Washington is no longer content to engage with friends and allies via the old Cold War hub and spoke approach to bilateral relations. It has instead revived the so-called quadrilateral security dialogue or quad, a group that was formed amongst the leaders of the US, Australia and India and Japan in the wake of the earthquake and tsunami that devastated populations of the Indian Ocean in December, 2004. And the Biden administration is also attempting to breathe new life into a loose multilateral arrangement known as the free and open Indo-Pacific. This is an approach that is rooted in the ideas of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of Japan and that gained widespread attention during the Trump administration. But the free and open Indochina remains a work in progress and many questions about its future and effectiveness remain. So these are just two of the examples that highlight the fact that the balance of power and institutional architecture in the region are in a constant state of change and that the future of regional security, both economic and military, is uncertain. Now, I'm pleased to say that our two special guests that are here with us today will help us make sense of it all. Professor Nobukatsu Kanehara has had a long and distinguished career in the Japanese and diplomatic or in the Japanese diplomatic and political worlds. He has served, for example, in several positions in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, including as ambassador in charge of the United Nations and Human Rights, Deputy Chief of Mission in Seoul, Korea, and as minister in the Japanese Embassy at Washington, DC. From 2012 to 2019, he was a chief, Assistant Chief Cabinet Secretary to Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. He is also a recipient of the prestigious Legion of Honor from the Republic of France. And today, Kanehara Sensei is a faculty member in the Department of Political Science at Doshisha University in Kyoto. We will then hear from David Shear, and I'm so glad that he was able to join us. Um, Ambassador Shear's career also bridges the political and diplomatic worlds in fascinating ways. He joined the U.S. State Department in 1982 and has served in Washington, Sapporo, Beijing, Kuala Lumpur, and Tokyo. From 2011 to 2014, he served as U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam. He has also worked as Deputy Assistant Secretary for East Asian and Pacific Affairs in the State Department, and from 2014 to 2016 as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs. Today, Ambassador Shear is a, sh a chairman of the National Association of Japan America Society and a senior advisor at Matlarty Associates, a global strategic advisor. Now, to help get things started, we've asked Professor Kanehara and Ambassador Shear to speak for about 10 minutes each. And we've suggested, but not required, of course, that they include some commentary on one or more of the following themes in their remarks. First, we'd be very interested in hearing their views on the policies of their country toward a free and open Indo-Pacific and the Quad, and how and why these policies may be changing in response to the new Biden government in the US and the Suga government in Japan. 
We've also suggested that they touch on the evolving, how the evolving regional environment may um, impact the U.S. and Japanese leadership in the region, as well as the all-important U.S.-Japan bilateral relationship. And finally, we've suggested they touch on the implications of a changing regional architecture for, for China's position in the region and their country's engagement with Beijing. So after their initial remarks, I'll raise a few questions for our speakers and attempt to get a, a broader conversation started. And in about half an hour, we'll open the floor to questions, or a little less than half an hour, we'll open the floor to questions from you, our audience. We've asked that you've, uh, you write your questions down in English in that little triangular icon in the upper right hand corner um, of your screen, you'll see that there's uh, something that you can click in order to register your question. So let me now turn the floor over to Professor Kanehara. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, thank, thank you. Thank you, Patty. Thank you very much, Kako-san. Hi, hi, Dave. Thank you very much for having me. Good evening, Austin. It's a great honor to be here. I'm going to make three points today. One is the, the coming emerging liberal international order in Asia. Second is the big challenge, of course, the rise of China. Third is multilateral approach to cope with it. That's the Quad and the FOIP. Let me start with the first one, the emerging liberal international order in Asia. We talk about some, somehow decline of the West, say Brexit, the America first of Mr. Trump. But I have to say, beating heart of world economy is moving to Asia. And the China is rising. Of course, India is rising next. Indian's population could be soon bigger than China, but, uh, but they are 10 years younger than Chinese. And while the precursors of industrialization, advanced industrial democracies, paved the way for the liberal order in 19th century, Japan was the, one of the first opener of the parliament in Asia. In 1890, we opened the imperial parliament. The same year, we had general elections. We had strange military-led time, 15 years, but it's an aberration. And Japan, gave, Japan came back to democracy. And the precursors, for example, the G7 nations were leading the world. But meantime, Asia was preparing their own way to join our liberal order. While we are working for liberalism or democracy in 19th century, early 20th century, they were under colonial rule. They were discriminated racially. They were deprived of the sovereignty and their human rights was abused. They got independence, but after independence, after the Second World War, many nations turned to dictatorship, communist or military junta or simply populist dictator, simply because dictatorship was their thoughts more efficient to achieve quick industrialization. And this was over. During the half of the 20th century, many things changed. The Asian nations got independence, and the precursors changed a lot. The systemic racial discrimination was put on end, and dictatorship fell one by one in Asia. And in 1980s, the Industrial Revolution that the precursors thought their privilege, the, the Industrial Revolution just spread to all over Asia. Precursors were Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. These were called Asian for tigers. Now it covers the maritime ASEAN nations, and the Industrial Revolution is going to the West, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and India. And that must cover African continents in the latter half of this century. African 1 billion people, average age is 19 years old. Amazing, isn't it? Japan is 49 years old. Mm -hmm. Americans 39 years old. Chinese 39 years old. And Indians 29 years old. Mm -hmm. We see where the future is. But we have to embrace them in the same framework of this international liberal order. We have to do that. The big challenge is of, course, is, of course, China. China, we thought they would be joining us. When they say bye-bye to Mao's extremism, Japan embraced them. Of course, they had bad memory of the war. And we have to, Japan believed that we have to engage Chinese. 
Even now, after Tiananmen massacre, where the P88 tanks massacred kids crying freedom, only Japan stood by China, because and where Japan received a huge criticism from the West. But we said, we can't push back China to Maoism. They are coming towards us. And we helped them to join the WTO. Even Emperor went to China just after Tiananmen. And working hard to engage China, finally we see China amazingly leaving us. It's a big shock to us. We thought China was with us to finish dictatorship in Soviet Union. We were successful. Amazingly, China is stepping into Soviet shoes and facing us, carving out new sphere of influence. It's a wrong way, wrong path for China to follow. We have to prevent China from derailing from the path for liberalism. It takes time. China will become bigger than the United States in terms of economy by 2030. Amazing, isn't it? United States will be the number two in 10 years' time. Uh, it's coming. India is rising very quickly. Already, India is half size of Japan today. Japan is number three. In world economy, Japan will be number four by 2040. US, China, India will be the three biggest economy. But the Indian economy is trying to take off, but it takes 10 to 20 years. Uh, it's not early enough to rebalance Chinese growth today. China changed, uh, regrettably. There are several causes for that. I would I would mention three elements here. In 2008, the Lehman shock shook the West, and all the Western economies fell. China stood up. It was just like West of Germany and Japan in 1970s after two two oil shocks. Japan, West Germany were, was were, were called to Rambouillet, and G7 started, and we rehabilitated. And suddenly that gave a some erroneous confidence of Japan the economic giants. It was not true, but the, we were sort of overconfident. The same thing is happening today in China. They led the world economy, and in G20 meetings, they were the hero. And they erroneously thought, now this is Chinese time. They have their time. Number one, they can reshape the world to their taste. It's a big mistake, but they are thinking in that way. Second is, after Tiananmen, the communist ideology is dead, because Deng Xiaoping shut the door against the democracy, but he said bye-bye to Marx-Leninism. Very strange type of state capitalism started. And there, the, to avoid the criticism from the jingoistic communist senior people, then started to imprint among the Chinese kids the legend of foundation of Chinese Communist Party. That is, Chinese Communist Party brought China to this status and the prosperity and respectable status in the world, but he emphasized 150 years invasions by the West, including, of course, Japan. And that's, that is becoming poisonous. Together with the soaring nationalism, uh, it is very bad. Today's their strategy is very simple. China, humiliated by Westerners, 150 years, should take back Qing Dynasty's territory. And Qing Dynasty is not a modern state. It is not our modern states. There was no border, but they have tributary states. They half independent, like Korea, the other surrounding nations. Japan has never been under Chinese control, but the tributary states, and China, today's China thinks that it is their territory that they are taking back. Hong Kong is the example. It was territory taken by the British by the Dirty Opium War. So they have to take, take it back. And free will of the Hong Kongese doesn't count here. It's the revenge of the history, not the free will of the people that decides the territory. This is very erroneous thinking. And Xi Jinping is in the is particular leader. That generation from 1966 through 1976, there was no university in China because of cultural revolution. They destroyed intelligentsia. And Xi's generation is that generation. So they never they never seen the liberalism. They never thought of democracy. It's revival of Mao's theater. And they still believe that the communist regime could be superior to the West. So this is very bad. Now it is it is in practice. They are expanding their interest in South China Sea, East China Sea. They claim South China Sea as Chinese Sea. It is far bigger than the Mediterranean. 
never under Chinese control. But they say it is their sea. Hong Kong's freedom was put to an end. Uyghurs, Tibetans were abused. And they are now, their eyes are now on Taiwan. Taiwan is a 23 million people. It's a very big sort of entity, community, de facto basis. It's a nation, a free nation. And now they are putting end to the Taiwan freedom, if they could, as Hong Kong. How to cope with that? We have to do this multilaterally. Nobody can stand up against China alone. If if somebody does that, they'd be simply crushed by China. So we Japan proposed two things. One is FOIP, free and open in the Pacific. We talk about the victory of freedom and liberalism. It takes time, but we believe that the industrial nation, nation state will turn into democracy. It simply takes 100 years. China needs half a century more. But meantime, they're big enough and they could challenge us. So we have to cope with it. We have to gather the like-minded nations who carries torch of democracy, freedom, rule of law. That's United States, Japan, ASEAN nations, Australia, Korea, and Europe. And of course, American leadership is vital. Without it, we can't do that. Mr. Trump was very hard against China, but he was sort of drama. He was playing alone. Now, Mr. Biden came back. He's a, he a conductor of orchestra. We're happy to be orchestrated, but we need American leadership here. What? The, when we talk about democracy, values, and economic integration, connectivities, infrastructure, FOIP is a very good framework as a grand strategy. But when we talk about the military affairs and the strategic capabilities, strategic st uh, stabilities, uh, some nations raise hands, not all. Who raised the hands? It's Australia, American Stone China in the Pacific, and India, that is a future superpower. We are happy to engage Koreans, we're happy to engage Indonesians, happy to engage British who is now outside Europe. It can be Cinque or Sextet, we don't matter. But simply because Quad is Quad, simply because there are only four members in it. But this is very important. To keep strategic balance with China is very important. Without it, China can bully one by one the small nations. And to, by keeping a strategic balance, we can adjust interests. We can deter China, we can dissuade China from invading Taiwan, for example. And we can wait for China to become more mature, responsible. And I believe that the necessity of history is not victory of China. Necessity of history is the victory of liberalism. And China can never cope with it in the future. Okay, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Kanehara. Um, this was very insightful, and I think we're going to get lots of interesting comments on this. Um, I now want to turn the floor to Ambassador Shear. And Ambassador Shear, we have sung your praises. We've introduced you. We're sorry you missed it, um, but we're looking forward to your remarks. And I understand you have a PowerPoint presentation for us. I do, Patty. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, spend a couple of seconds here and get my PowerPoint up. OK. Well, it's not it's not working. Well, I can see it. Can you see the PowerPoint? Uh, well, now I've turned it. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> I did at the beginning. There it is. Ah. Do you see it? Not anymore. I'm sorry, everybody. Do you want to give it another try, or would you prefer to just wing it without it? Now oh, there it is. Can you see it? No. Okay, I can do it without the. I can do it without the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk um, less about the substance of the alliance with Japan, and more about uh, a process. And that process was the diplomatic campaign that the new Biden administration conducted from day one of its administration through the meeting between Secretary of State Blinken and National Security Advisor Sullivan with the Chinese in Alaska last week. What's a diplomatic campaign? 
I think you can define a diplomatic campaign as a series of diplomatic actions designed to generate mass, psychological mass and momentum, and to bring that diplomatic mass and momentum together on a point. And in this case, we wanted to bring that diplomatic mass together at a point on the Chinese sitting across from us at the table in Alaska. And we did that by conducting the diplomatic campaign. And when Secretary Blinken and National Security Advisor Sullivan and their staff sat down probably in November or December to plan out the early days of the, the, uh, the administration, they asked themselves some questions. One was, who's the president going to call when he gets in office? And in what order is he going to do that? The second question was, where are we going to go? The third question was, what are we going to do when we get there? And what are we going to say? And clearly, they were interested in demonstrating both to the region and to our allies, particularly to the Chinese, how important our alliances are to us and the level of priority we place on them. So they decided to visit um, Japan and the ROK first. Not only did they decide to visit uh, but they decided to visit together, which is unprecedented for an administration, for the Secretary of D Defense and the Secretary of State to travel together like this so early in an administration. Um, but first, the telephone calls. Who were they going to call? Well, the, the president started calling foreign leaders um, uh, on January 22nd. And the first leaders he called were uh, Trudeau and Obrador. Canada and Mexico, our closest neighbors, our NAFTA buddies. Uh, then they turned to Europe, our NATO allies, always the first people we, we call uh, in this situation. And the president talked first to Boris Johnson, then to um, uh, Emmanuel Macron of France, then to um, uh, uh, Angela Merkel of West Germany. And only then did he speak to Putin. Why did they put Putin, say, before Prime Minister Suga of Japan? Because they wanted to get Putin as soon as possible after they talked to our other European allies to bring some momentum together on Putin. Then the president turned to Asia. He talked to Prime Minister Suga on January 27th. Australian Prime Minister Morrison on February 3rd, also um, President Moon of the ROK on February 3rd, then Indian Prime Minister Modi, then on February 10, Xi Jinping. Why in that order? To demonstrate the importance we placed on Japan and our allies and partners, and to bring that momentum to bear on the President's call with Xi Jinping. A week after the president's call with Xi Jinping, eight days actually, we conducted a quad foreign ministers meeting. Secretary of State Blinken met with his quad counterparts from India, Australia, and Japan in order to prepare for a later quad summit. On March 3, the administration released the interim national security guidance a document designed to replace the Trump administration's national security strategy. And they, they wanted to get it out as soon as they could to let everybody know, we've got a plan. We're putting it out. On March 10, Secretary Blinken testified before the House Foreign Affairs Committee about Secretary Biden's overall foreign policy, about the interim national security guidelines, and about the administration's future plans. He focused as not only on the importance of our alliances, but on our disquiet 
with uh, Chinese behavior, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the Uyghurs and the people of Hong Kong. We can, the president conducted the Quad Summit meeting remotely on March 12. They issued a great declaration, um, uh, particularly with regard to uh, the distribution, global distribution of vaccines. The Quad agreed to have India manufacture up to a billion doses of vaccines. Japan and the US finance it, the Australians deliver it. This is the, the first time the Quad has ventured this deeply into diplomacy. It's been mostly focused on security affairs up until this time. It's the first time the Quad ventured into health diplomacy, very important health diplomacy, the mass distribution of vaccines globally, but particularly in Southeast Asia. On March 15, Secretary of Defense Austin visited the Indo-Pacific Command in Honolulu, which secretaries of defense often do on their way out to Asia. Um, on his way to Tokyo for the two plus two meeting with Secretary Blinken and their Japanese counterparts on March 16. On the same day, the administration announced new sanctions on Chinese individuals for their conduct related to Hong Kong. Now that's what I call a strong message. They went to Seoul, the two went to Seoul, conducted a two plus two meeting with their ROK counterparts on uh, March 17 and went into meetings in Alaska with Yang Jiechi leading the Chinese side and Foreign Minister Wang Yi. In Tokyo, again, they conducted a two plus two meeting with their Japanese counterparts, the two secretaries with their Japanese counterparts. They issued a two plus two statement, which reaffirmed the importance of the US-Japan alliance and outlined some of the things we'll be doing together in the future. Um, uh, they did the same in Seoul uh, and they, they arrived in Beijing able to deal with the Chinese from a position of strength. That is a, an now oft repeated phrase by this administration. We're gonna deal with our adversaries, our rivals from a position of strength and conducting a diplomatic campaign like that is what allows you to do that. And it is in that context that our alliance with Japan is critically important to us because we couldn't have generated that mass or that momentum without our alliance with Japan. And you saw the result on the news with the 16 minute harangue by director Yang Jiechi, followed by his foreign minister partner. As they, as they went into meetings with the Americans. Chinese very upset about the sanctions, about uh, President Biden's overall approach to, apparent overall approach to China, about our behavior in the South China Sea, and a variety about the tariffs that the Biden administration has yet to lift, left over from the Trump administration. So, that meeting started with a bang, but they, they went into the private section of the meeting. They held two days of talks. Yang Jiechi on the Chinese side came out and said we had a candid constructive uh, uh, meeting. He said, we have some differences, but we'll continue to talk about them. Tony Blinken came out and said, we achieved what we aimed to achieve, which was to make it absolutely clear to the Chinese what our positions are on issues like Hong Kong and Xinjiang, and to describe for the Chinese where the Biden administration is going globally and regionally with our foreign policy. So that's how you construct a diplomatic campaign designed to get what you want. Now, the meeting in Alaska didn't result in a lot of big, flashy deliverables 
but it got the message across to the Chinese in crystal clear terms. They met the Chinese and spoke to them from a position of strength. We couldn't have done that without the alliance with Japan. So it's in that context that the alliance with Japan played an extremely important role. We're partners here. And in fact, without that alliance more broadly, the US simply couldn't be a global power. We certainly couldn't be a regional power in the Indo-Pacific. We couldn't do what we want to do on the diplomatic stage in the region or bring the mass we diplomatic mass we need to bring to bear on the Chinese. We couldn't do all that. As Kamihara san said, we've got to work multilaterally, and we do that with our partners in the Quad. We do that particularly strongly with our ally, Japan. Why don't I stop there? Thank you so much, Ambassador Shear. These were both very interesting and I would say provocative uh, sets of, of remarks. And I'm also very grateful that you did touch on several of those suggested items that we hoped would lay the, lay the foundation for a fruitful conversation today. Um, just for the next a few minutes, we want to leave lots of time for Q&A, um, given our late start. Uh, let me just throw out a few questions and uh, as might be expected in this situation in March of 2021, given all that we know about the region, China seems to be first and foremost in our thinking about how to engage with the region going forward. Um, and I'd like, to, I'd like to throw two questions out there um, and one of them might ruffle some feathers. Um, but the first is, is it really possible to engage China today? Has it been successful in the past? Do we have reason to believe that it will work? Can we revive the policies of the Clinton administration and engage them? Or are we moving into a period in which confrontation is going to be uh, the primary strategy? Building on, I think, the, um, the actions of the Trump administration. So I'd be very interested in hearing your both of your views on that point. And also, um, there's some talk right now, and it's been going on for years, and it's becoming more and more intense that the United States is no longer negotiating from a position of strength. That how could it possibly do that when economically uh, we are not the leader that we used to be? China seems to have moved in that into that position. Um, what are our pockets of strength? When we talk about American strength, what does it mean today? And are we up to the task? of dealing with a, with a China um, that is more and more our equal rather than our junior um, and posing numerous challenges for the United States in the years ahead. So um, if I can turn first to uh, Professor Kanehara, what are your thoughts on these and related issues? Thank you very much, Betty. Uh, for, for some time, it's very difficult to engage China, but we can, we can do that reasons. China today represents 16% of world economy. United States, 24%. They can they could catch up with the United States, but, but by, by 2050, US will go up beyond China again. Oh. And Japan, Japan, Japan is one quarter of the US today, number three, but very small, and one third of China. And Korea is one quarter of ours. And half of Korea is Australia and Taiwan. The Europeans without British, they count roughly 20% of world GNP. So if the West is united, US, Europe, Brit the UK, Japan, Australia, Korea, India, we can go easily beyond 50% of the world economy. China can never catch up with the West. That means if the West is united, we can still engage Chinese. And this is one, but I have to say, Two, 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 two reservations for that. One is the West must be united. Mr. Trump's China policy was a hard one. Partially it was it was a right one, but the he hurt so much the alliance with the West. We had Abesan, we are lucky. We are we are the only, maybe only one who could maintain good relationship with Washington, but all the leaders are weeping how to cope with Mr. Trump. And so the West must be orchestrated. It's the only leader for that so capable of doing that is the United States. We, we are, we're ready to stand with the United States here and we need allies. And second is the time. 
uh, we have to, we are, we are, we are united, we are okay. When India stands up as a superpower, I'm much more comfortable. Mm. But it takes time. Meantime, China is the huge power that can bully <laughs> other surrounding nations. And how to prevent China from derailing from our liberal path, and we need effort for that. And it takes time. Twenty years to come. We have to be, have to be prepared for that. What is our strength? As I said, we have a strong private sector, and the economy is rising. Technology. We are ahead of that. China is copying us. They are very good in doing digital technology simply because they have to survey one point four billion people. That's the reason why they're, they're so much interested in digital yuan, but for surveillance, it's not for us. And that has some, must have some limits. We are working for it, making people's life better. That's technology. Mm. And US is the cutting edge of this technology. And we still believe that technological edge, economic strength, and the military too. US Pentagon's budget is $800 billion. It's mm. one percent of world GNP, amazing, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Chinese military budget is four times bigger than Japanese one, but it is still one quarter of the United States. You have a very strong cutting edge of the military. Mm. And China will not risk a war against the United States simply because if they are defeated, Communist Party is over. So mm. they don't do that. Mm. So the military, military, military wise, technology wise, and the economic size wise, the West is far stronger than China. So when we are united, we can still engage China. That's a very interesting perspective. Thank you so much. And Ambassador Shear, what are your views on these issues? Well, if by engagement you mean um, uh, working with China in the expectation that they're someday going to become a liberal democracy, <laughs> then I'd say no. We 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 we're, we don't shouldn't engage China in that way. But if by engagement you mean negotiating with them from a position of strength, then by all means, yes. Um, uh, uh, we need to negotiate with the Chinese every day on a variety of things. It's unavoidable particularly given their size, their new wealth, and their new power. Mm -hmm. uh, on the subject of, well, are we in the position of strength? I'd say yes, for every reason that Kamehameha-san gave. We're still the world's biggest economy. We're still the bearer of the liberal flame in this world. Um, and I mean liberal in the classical sense there. Um, uh, and we are a technological and military superpower the Chinese respect and fear that, um, whether they show it or not. And I've seen that throughout a career, a 30 year career in dealing with the Chinese. Mm -hmm. They respect power and they respect le a leadership that can aggregate power and bring it to bear on our problems. Um, and when we can bring it to bear on the Chinese, they listen. They don't always do what we want them to do, but they listen and they will often do what we want them to do. Mm. Um, just a follow up question. There's amongst international relations scholars, there's a lot of discussion of sort of a decoupling of American security or military power on the one hand and economic power on the other. And attention to the fact that China has become the most important trade partner for virtually all of the countries of East and Southeast Asia today. And the United States has lost that distinction. And I don't mean to say the US is weak. I mean to highlight the uh, changes in an economic balance of power in the region. Um, and yet at the same time, militarily, in terms of security, there's a lot of, I think, attention to the United States and, and, and strong relations. But for each of the countries, and I would suggest even Japan, um, there is a need to hedge in this environment. Um, Japan needs the security relationship with Japan, with the United States. Um, it's important, as Dr. Kanehara has just uh, pointed out, 
for Japan and the United States to exercise leadership together as it was important in the past, it's going to be important in the future. But Japan also has a very important and strong trade relationship with China and will not want, or at least one of the arguments is, will not want to jeopardize that relationship. So it finds itself trying to juggle these two sets of interests. Meanwhile, calling a spade a spade under the Trump administration, there has been an effort to, uh, I think, loosen dependence of the United States on the Chinese economy, which has distanced the United States economically from China. So am I off the wall here, or do you, do you agree with this sort of scholarly view? Um, and, and what are your thoughts about what the, the regional architecture will look like and the balance of power as a result of some of these really systemic uh, structural shifts within the region. Uh, Connie, how to sense it? But, but by the way, before um, we ask for responses, I do want to encourage our audience, please do write your questions down in the question section. Again, it's that little uh, triangle in your upper right-hand corner that has a triangle, a square, and a circle in it. Click that, and you'll see the area where you can enter your questions. So um, to you, Professor Kanehara. Thank you very much, Patty. The you know the, we tends we tend to take lessons from the immediate past. So confrontation is confrontation with the Soviets, and this is not the case with China. We have to go back beyond Cold War. Say, for example, UK and Germany rivalry before the First World War, and UK was heavily investing into into Germany. And at that time, people said there would be no war because the interdependence is so big and huge and deep. It was a great illusion. Right. And the, the, this that is the situation. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to manage this situation, one. And two, uh, if we say, okay, economy is okay, we have to continue with China and China grows. China is not like us. It is one single party that commands the Military, military is not a national military, it is a party's military. And they command academia, universities, and industries, and the, the Alibaba, the fintech people. It's it's only only one under one command. And Xi Jinping's goal is not to make the world happier. He, his goal is 19th century. China is big enough, great enough, strong enough. We have to be the leader. We ask why? <laughs> why? Power is not everything. They have to lead values, the responsibility, engagement of the others. They can't do it. And I have to say, Japan is the nation that refused to be under Chinese influence for 2,000 years. Even in the 17th century, British delegation and Japanese delegation refused to kowtow. You have to see, you have to put your front nine times on the floor to see the Emperor of China. <laughs> British and Japanese said, don't, don't do that. So we're not allowed into the Forbidden Palace. <laughs> and this is where we are. We hate to, we are like British, we are free, we are free people in the sea. <laughs> we don't be under continental oppression. <laughs> but to, now China is big enough, too big, to survive, we need the the coalition of the like-minded nations and the leadership of the United States. That that's the reason why we're ready to stand up. And right. as far as we are united, I think we are okay. Like like Dave said, uh, it's it's not imaginable that we teach China the democracy. They don't accept it. Now they are on the other side. We can face democracy, they say, but there will be democracy. Maybe towards the end of the century, they, they turn like us. But meantime, we have to be united and challenge. And the as far as the decoupling is concerned, I have to say the toys are toys can be made by Chinese. We don't complain about it. Semiconductors, 5Gs, TikToks, cyber intelligence, about tech. And yes. the water, the high tech, high tech weapons. There, we have to be vigilant. That's the reason why we are talking about supply chains. We're talking about restrictions of technology flow, restrictions of Chinese investments. There, we don't control market without reasons. A market is very often smarter than the government, mm. so we have to yeah. go. <laughs> but but they, they are paid more than the government officials. <laughs> they, but we have to intervene and regulate only when national security is the matter. 
Oh, thank yeah. you. That's very interesting. Um, uh, Ambassador Shear, your view. Thank you. Let me start just first by apologizing. I'm going to have to jump off it for another Zoom at 8.30. Um, uh, I'm sorry for the technical glitch. I think we should be done by then. <laughs> I've, got a, I've, got another, I've got another Zoom at 8.30. It's been a busy day. But let me, uh, let me, let me address your questions uh, first by talking about the Trump administration. There was a lot of chaos in Trump administration foreign policy, but they, they got some things right. And one of the things they got right was that we need to change the uh, relationship with China. And that decision got a lot of bipartisan support in Washington and I think throughout the country. They decided that we've got to get tough on China on trade. Now, you may not agree that the Trump administration went at it in, in the right way, but um, deciding to change the trade relationship with China was very important. And the Biden administration, I think, is going to continue um, that, that way of thinking. The Trump administration also decided that some industries we've got to have back in the United States, particularly industries of strategic importance to us. We can't outsource all of that. And finally, um, we got to protect our technology. That too enjoys very strong bilateral support uh, in Washington. Um, and the Biden administration certainly is going to continue uh, that, that approach. It's going to uh, systematize the way we do it. And it's going to bring our allies on board in partnership with Japan on that. So um, uh, there's so, there are distinct continuities between the Biden and Trump administrations on China. On the subject of um, decoupling, I don't think it's possible for us to totally decouple. And, and just like Kanehara-san, I'm happy to buy toys from China. Um, uh, but at the same time, we're going to have to compete with the Chinese. And not just in the military sphere, which we're very good at, but in the economic sphere. And we're going to have to do this in new and creative ways, ways that we haven't used in the past. And we're going to have to focus on regions that we haven't um, focused on very intensely in a while, like Southeast Asia. Right. You look at the strategic map of Asia, Northeast Asia, we have lots of military forces. We have strong, reliable, and capable allies. Southeast Asia, much less the case. Few forces, much less reliable allies, um, less clear why we'd go to war in Southeast Asia. So we're going to have to sort through all that. But Southeast Asia, in the Chinese view, and in our view as well, is an open playing field. And there's going to be greatly increased competition in Southeast Asia. It can't just be military competition. We've got to get in there and invest and build infrastructure and, and win over Southeast Asians in the- That's a, in the that's a very good point. In the peacetime game of influence. That's a really good point. And, and I wanted to turn to Southeast Asia. And we have a couple of questions about that before I raise them. Um, I understand that, uh, David, you have to leave by uh, 8.30 your time. A question for Mrs. Ito. Given that we did have a late start and some of our viewers had trouble getting on, um, might we continue for an extra 10 minutes tonight? I wish I could join. No, I, I know you'll have to leave us, but... Uh, I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay. All right. Well, we'll... we'll spend a few more minutes we'll go a little over um, our time and thank you to our audience for your patience so on the subject of southeast asia we have a question from a former ut student named jada fraser um, about southeast asian perceptions of japan and she notes uh, and other countries and she notes that in a survey conducted in 2021 southeast asia highlighted japan as the country toward which they feel a great deal of trust in the region um, now, uh, ASEAN is worried about the region being exploited by U.S.-China great power competition. And in that context, what can Japan do uh, in order to exercise a stronger leadership role to advance FOIP principles and engage more with Southeast Asia? And I'll say that I'm already aware that Japan is already doing some of this engagement. Isn't that right, Professor um, Kaneada? Yeah, that's right. Um, since 1990, 91, when the Cold War is over, our my, my senior 
diplomats started to say, then now, now Cold War is over, we have to be proactive. We helped a lot. The Eastern Europe, it's only Japan who powered huge amount of money into Eastern Europe, because Europeans here as a Soviet invasion still. But we intervened and helped Poles and Romanians and Bulgarians to stand up. This is what we did in the 1990s. We did the same thing in Southeast Asia too. Mm -hmm. They are turning to democracy one by one. We thought, we thought they are great, great partners, friends, but we have to make them prosperous, make Southeast Asia stand up. That we believe that both in Eastern Europe, in ASEAN, we're greatly successful. And prosperous, stable Asia is our national interest. Mm -hmm. We didn't think that China was challenge us at that time, but now the friends are very important and our investments are becoming fruitful. Japan will do three things. One is we still continue to say liberal democracy, that regime can make people happy. We have to get the consent of the people to rule. The, they are, we are, the government is instruments. People is not the instrument of government. It's the, it's the, the other way around. This is very good for Asian thinking. Asian didn't have elections, didn't have the independent judiciary, but long standing political philosophy of Asia is the king must serve the people. Mm. If the king abuses people, the king must be decapitated. <laughs> That's mentioned 2,300 years ago. And I was saying, China was saying that. We don't teach that to the young kids today, but that's, that's, that's Chinese thinking. And so the liberal democracy is not alien to Asians. We have to spread that. This is one. Two, economic prosperity. We have to still overcome the difficulties of nature. That is mountains and big sea. We are preparing ports to connect Asians and cutting across the mountains in Vietnam to connect both the seas. This, this is connectivity efforts. Japan is doing that very much. China is doing this, but Chinese way is a bit different. Chinese way is Russian pipeline strategy. China is the center. Engage the vicinity, the nations one by one in this way. The star shape. Mm. We are matrix. Mm. We are connecting everywhere somehow to make information, money, merchandise, people, flow free that's what we are doing to simply enhance regional integration the, we are very happy if united states comes back to tpp tpp represents 13 percent of the world economy if us joins it's almost 40 percent our steps dominated by china we are, we are still there to, to mitigate <laughs> that influence our set is represent only 30 percent of world gnp and our is much less free trade system than tpp we're very happy if the U.S. is back and we can talk about the regional economic integration and prosperity. We know Trumpians are still very strong. It's not easy to, to, to come back to TPP. We strongly recommend the U.S. to come back to the throne. It's still open, waiting for you. And finally, as Dave said, China does not listen to the weak. So we have to be united. Then we can have an equal thing. Even Japan cannot face China alone these days. They are so strong today. And Chinese men, the emotions are coming, dark, dark emotions are coming up from Chinese bottom of the heart. Don't look down upon me again. That's China today. We respect them. That's fine. But we have to have an equal footing to talk to them and then engage them from the, as I must said, from the position of strength. Yes. And this is what we are thinking today. We can't do this alone. And I have said it's only Japan here for facing Chinese. Koreans fear so much China. They don't come from China. Mm -hmm. Australia was just what they are like. They are in the southern hemisphere, <laughs> very far away. Mm -hmm. And we are the only outpost that's facing Chinese. That means we have to hedge a bit because we are frontal. And we have Russians here too. We have nuclear North Korea here too. Our neighbors are very bad. <laughs> <laughs> and we are standing alone here. So sometimes we are cautious, but our stance is firm. Yeah. Um, Professor, Shu, uh, Ambassador Shu, do you have any comments on that, on, on the yes, relationship Asia. between with, with South Southeast Asia? Southeast Asia will be increasingly important, partly because it's an open playing field strategically, partly because there's over 600 million Southeast Asians. They have a huge economy collectively. It's within the top 10 economies, the ASEAN economy. Um, is among the top 10 economies. Um, their economies are the fastest growing economies in the world. The Vietnamese economy grew 3% in 
last year, even in the midst of a, a COVID pandemic. They're going to bounce back at seven or eight percent this year. Um, so they're they're very fast growing, and it's a strategic area. Um, uh, a huge percentage of shipping passes through the Malacca Strait and the South China Sea. Large amounts of Japanese and Chinese energy imports flow through the Malacca Strait. It's hugely strategic. So we have to be there. And it helps to put this in perspective by discussing what the Chinese are telling people in the region about us. They're telling Southeast Asians that the United States is washed up. They're telling them that stick with us and you'll get rich, stick with the Americans and all you, you'll get are US Navy ship visits. <laughs> They're saying the, uh, the, the American model is the old model. Our model is the new business model. The Americans are blockbuster video. We're Netflix. Yes, funny. <laughs> so stick with us. That's Point what they're telling Southeast Asians. And our problem in Southeast Asia is not just the military problem. It's not just about security and military confrontation. It shouldn't be about military confrontation at all. It should be about deterrence. And it should be about increased American economic and cultural interaction with Southeast Asia, sometimes with Japan in the lead. Okay. Japan has exercised incredible leadership, both in foreign direct investment in Southeast Asia generally, in infrastructure, and in saving the Trans-Pacific Partnership. When we pulled out, Prime Minister Abe not only stayed in, but he got everybody else to stay in as well. And they're waiting for us to come back. Let me um, let me raise the last question of the evening. I know we're all pressed for time, and I'm going to pose it first to uh, Ambassador Shear. Um, and it pulls on a couple of questions that I see in the uh, Q&A, and that also returns us to the themes, the opening themes of this uh, session. And that's multilateral multilateralism in dealing with the security challenges of the region today. Um, ASEAN, the Association for Southeast Asian Nations, is in the news a lot um, for not being as unified as it used to be, and this has been underscored by its sometimes diverse responses and uh, of its members to the recent coup in Myanmar. Um, and ASEAN appears to be left behind by the Quad. There is no Southeast Asian member of it, um, and it's unclear the role that ASEAN will take in uh, the FOIP, as we're calling it tonight. And I just want to ask, after years and years in which ASEAN was the institutional core of just about every approach to multilateralism we're, we've had, including APEC and the ASEAN Regional Forum, um, it seems to be eclipsed a little bit right now. What do you envision for ASEAN, given the new security architecture that's emerging within this, uh, within this important region? Ambassador Scheer. Thanks. Well, ASEAN certainly isn't as unified as it used to be. It used to be much smaller by five countries. It used to be just the maritime ASEAN, the maritime Southeast Asia, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei, Singapore, Thailand. Um, and the, the height of ASEAN unity was during the Viet Vietnamese occupation of Cambodia. When that ended and with it, the Cold War, um, uh, the continental Southeast Asians joined ASEAN and ASEAN became a much more diverse and in many ways disunited group of countries just because it added so many different members. That said, since the 1990s, ASEAN has established some critically important diplomatic forums uh, that cover regional affairs, hmm. including the East Asia Summit which brings the ASE 10 ASEAN countries together, along with six dialogue partners, including the United States, Japan, Korea, Australia, China. Um, every year they meet in, in the fall. President Trump went to only one of those meetings. It will be critically important for President Biden to show up. But showing up isn't all he'll have to do. 
he'll have to go there with a, a big, important agenda that includes both security issues and economic and cultural issues as well. And I have no doubt that the administration is preparing him to do that. He'll have to participate in the APEC summit, which is a, a broader um, economic cooperation group, including some uh, South American countries. Um, also very important. These are extremely important fora in which we not only meet multi multilaterally, but we meet bilaterally on the sidelines with lots and lots of different leaders. It's a perfect opportunity for us to get our message out into the region, to show the region that we are interested, to show the region that we can show up, and to coordinate diplomatically with our like-minded allies and partners like Japan, Australia, and India. So ASEAN remains very important, even though it's, uh, it's um, less unified than it used to be. And Thanks. Southeast Asian countries have agency. They're not lying prostate, prostrate, waiting for Chinese railroads to run them over. They have agency. The Vietnamese don't like the Chinese. They're concerned about Chinese influence in their country. And mm. they, they know what they want, and they're able to get it. They've been dealing with the Chinese for thousands of years, as have the Thai as have the Burmese and the Indonesians. They all have their own interests. They know how to pursue them. And one of the key functions of the free and open Indo-Pacific is to strengthen their independence, to give them more room for, for maneuver, to allow them to hedge effectively if they must. That's what a balance of power in Southeast Asia will look like if we are successful. And only Japan and the United States can, in connection with our, our allies, can bring that kind of balance of power into existence. Thank you so much. These are, uh, I think, very important points. And let me just Patty, speak- I'm sorry, I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to pull out here, but- Yes. And everybody's patience tonight. And thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And I, I just wish I could do this for the rest okay. of the and I wanted to thank you on behalf of the Japan America Society for joining us. And uh, we know you have to jump out quickly. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. And Professor Kanahara, um, you. I'll give uh, you the last word. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me tonight. Uh, ASEAN is a great success in terms of the liberal multilateral diplomacy. Thank there, you so they, much. Uh, they just picked up our practice in the United Nations that the Americans started. If you compare that Soviet type multilateralism in Central Asia, it's very different. They are big ones, bully, small ones, boom, boom. <laughs> That's Central Asia. Never happened that that never happened in Southeast Asia. Singapore, the smallest country, is sitting equally to the Indonesia, the huge nation. And that's ASEAN. We have to comment that. That's a crown jewel of this liberal Asian order. And they are inviting big ones, Russians, Chinese, Japanese, Americans, and Australians, Indians. And we have to comment that they, that their efforts. That's very flexible. <laughs> that's very, you have to spend a lot of time for a karaoke and golf if you go there. Americans complain that much, a lot. But the <laughs> Secretary, Secretary Powell, when he was in the, in the States, he came to this meeting and he mounted a theater in the party and he became a sheriff and our female foreign minister Tanaka Makiko plays the role of Pocahontas <laughs> but you have to do that with them and this is their way it's a bit time consuming but when Japan was confused economically after Lehman shock and with the very unstable political situation we didn't pay much attention to ASEAN when Prime Minister Abe went back to ASEAN, he met regularly every year the leaders. He met 30 times for each leader. And when Abe -san is back into ASEAN, what did he did they say? They said, Welcome back, welcome back. We thought you abandoned us. That the message first message that Abe -san heard. He was astonished. We were always with you. No, they thought they abandoned. And the, the, we abandoned ASEAN, we jumped into China as a big market. The, we have to pay attention to them, and friendship must be a steady one. 
when they say you, you come to see us only when you need me that's not friendship friendship right. must be cultivated on a permanent basis that's our efforts not their efforts and the ASEAN is diverse today I have said there are six big ones or five big ones biggest is of course Indonesia Western hemisphere and they are, they are not facing China very much directly the China uh, is facing Vietnam and the Philippines bullying them very much they don't like China very much Malaysia says half size of Vietnam the Najib was very close to China but it's Mahathir and after after him the leaders are a bit wary about China but I have said Myanmar is in big problem we can't accept their coup but China takes this as opportunity enhance their influence again so we have to be careful and Brunei Laos Cambodia are taken in their in their hands Chinese diplomacy is very different from ours they start to attack the smallest ones mm. and make paralysis of the consensus of the group that's what's happening in in EU the Bulgaria Hungary these small nations are targets they use them Allies, EU consensus and here in Asia Brunei is heavily invested by Japan but the deep sea oil fields China claims that with the illegal claim but the Brunei is so fearful of China today Laos is next to China they are under heavy interest heavy influence from Vietnam so they are neutralized a bit but Laos cannot avoid Chinese influence Cambodia I have said they don't like Chinese very much it's it's it's, it's purport people China but the they the, the Cambodia is now coming up in the ladder of industrialization but Western private money does not flow into Cambodia very much so the Chinese money is very big for Cambodians so that's the reason why Hun Sen is with China but I don't think that he is faithful puppet of China at all they want to be escaped from that Chinese influence and we have to help them money wise China has a big money but we can always show them the choices you can choose and that's very important we have to engage ASEAN nations and it's very important half size of China population all rising economies but they need leadership and I have to say they do not want to be involved in big ones fights yeah. that's the reason why Quad is there we want to expand Quad we don't refuse them they don't join quite simply but we have to engage them in terms of economy in terms of values and when China becomes more coercive they would come towards us so quad can be sextet septet right but it is not exclusive I heard it referred to as an example of plurilateralism the quad yeah. and how it mm. can increase its size and include more members which I think is a, a, a heartening thing to think about yeah. um, so thank you so much for your remarks thank this you. is a good food for thought um, and I know that we're we're rapidly running out of time we're over time in fact and I see that Peter Kelly here is with us um, representing the National Association of Japan America societies and we were hoping to hear from you at the beginning but we're glad to have you now at the end of our session and I'm wondering Mr. Kelly if you'd like to say a few words to close us out Thanks very much, Patricia. And, and uh, this is uh, Peter Kelly from the National Association of Japan American Societies. We had over 80 people attending this uh, meeting tonight. We thank you for attending. Our apologies for the uh, difficulties in connection. This was the first time we've ever used Google Meeting and, uh, and uh, there were some connection problems. This event here is part of the Geo Strategy Series, which is a partnership between the Sasakawa Peace Foundation in Japan and the National Association of Japan American Societies. The whole purpose of this event is to take the kind of strategic discussion that we've heard tonight, the challenges that face the United States and Japan and Asia. That's often heard in Washington, D.C., but the purpose of this is to bring it out to other parts of the country. And uh, we're delighted that we were able to do that this evening. The event here was one of the unique aspects of tonight's event was the introduction of uh, ASEAN and Southeast Asia. It's played a larger part in the discussion tonight than we've heard in some of the previous discussions. And given the uh, importance of, of, of uh, Southeast Asia and the large Japanese investment there, it's a, it's a welcome topic to add. This uh, is the eighth of nine geostrategy events that have, have taken place over in Japan-American societies across the U.S. this past year. 
The last one will be tomorrow night in Atlanta with Sheila Smith and uh, and Koji Murata, which should be an entertaining combination, almost as entertaining as this evening with uh, with Dave Shear and uh, and Kane Hanasan. The speakers are what makes this series, and we're very grateful to both of them and to the moderator Patricia McLaughlin for uh, for hosting it tonight, and to the Japan America Society of Greater Austin, Kako Ito, for setting up this meeting. Well, thank you so much, um, Kelly-san. We're so glad you could join us, and, and we thank you for your assistance in putting this uh, meeting together. It's been wonderful for me to participate in. And I think um, I should turn this over to our host, uh, Mrs. Kako Ito, uh, to bring our evening to a close. No, you're all done? Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, then let me um, wish you all a very good evening. I thank you again uh, for joining us. If there are any other questions, please feel free to email us, um, and we hope to see you at a future event of the Japan America uh, Society of Greater Austin. Thank you, and good night. Okay. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.